Okay, okay we're live. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 105 of the Security Podcast on the In30 Network. And today we want to talk about a couple of things, but I think we have to start with Shodan. Now, that's not some name of some odd, like this awesome kung fu, but it's almost as good. I think very close. Shodan, I, 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 Tom showed me, I think, the picture that wins it, and we'll save it for the end. But this is this is awesome. So, Tom, what is Shodan? Shodan is a search engine, uh, to put it simply. Uh, but it's not just a, a search engine for web pages. Ah, that's boring, and Google's already got that all locked up. So what else can we search for? Well, uh, on the front page, they say it's a search engine for the Internet of Things. Um, and it's a search engine for webcams and for buildings and for the web. And it's just going to keep rolling through the site. It's a search engine for refrigerators, routers, power plants. And it goes on and on and on. What this is, is it's a search engine specifically designed to capture what a device is, what software it's running, what operating system it's running, where it is on the net, if it's got you know a web page to take a screenshot and index that. Uh, it's to let you find devices connected to the publicly accessible internet. And it's super powerful because you can say, hey, I wonder if anything's still susceptible to Heartbleed. If you're a security researcher, this is one of the first places you start your search if you're looking for wide areas of research to say, hey, I wonder how prevalent Heartbleed is today after everyone should be patched. So you go out, you say, oh, I'm going to search for web servers with SSL enabled of this version of OpenSSL or less. And it'll go out and it'll find it. And you can do research on it. You can see, hey, is Heartbleed actually exploitable on these systems? And in some cases, it will be. Uh, but you can find everything from routers to uh, webcams, which is really fun. And we've got a picture to share with you later. I, I, uh, I may have just be in that. This really? guy has his iOmega shared storage device. <laughs> With oh, that's fantastic. unauthenticated access live. <laughs> oh, wow. I, so, uh, I have pasted huh. that in. I mean, I don't. So, yeah, you could type anything you want. Like, you could see, yes, you could see baby sleeping if that's what you want to do. But I just first oh, click. Man. Uh, I Omega, which I didn't know still existed, but apparently they still do. And it has a self-signed certificate. <laughs> and now I'm on a home server. I'm oh, on a Lenovo home server page. I can add torrents. Just think about what that means. Wow, this is terrifying. Okay. So, and, so yeah, go ahead. for those of you playing at home, what, what this person has just done uh, is they've got a... Uh, a network attached storage device that they've hooked up directly to the internet. And you can access everything. You can put stuff there, you can pull stuff down. Um, this stuff happens a lot, a whole lot. Um, people don't think before they hook stuff to the net, right? They, they think, hey, here's this great thing, I'm gonna hook it up. And it's going to be done. It's going to be great. It's going to store all my files. And if the router has got UPnP enabled, sometimes they won't even know that it's publicly accessible. They think, oh, it's behind the router. It's fine. But if it's got UPnP and the device says, hey, could you open up port 80 so people can easily access me? And the router goes, oh, I've got UPnP. I've got wide open access. Sure. Why not open up port 80? And then that device is accessible to the wide open internet and to search engines like Shodan, which will go and index you. So, so you're saying, how are they figuring this out? I mean, it's, it's how are they searching so quickly so all these sites? And you just have to understand, there's only so many IP. So if you're unaware, which a lot of people are, your, your, I, your internet at home is, we call it a dotted quad. It's four, it's, it's four numbers, zero to 255, 
times four, and that's your internet address, just like your home address or a zip code. That's how you get there. The problem is, or the good thing is, they figured out that people don't actually know what, like you don't know Google's, you don't know Yahoo's, you don't know Amazon. They came up with this other idea of DNS, which is basically like the online phone book. But if you don't know the DNS address, because a lot of things don't have a DNS associated with it, like your webcam, they just tell you, go to this website, go here, go to these four numbers and you'll get in. Uh, they 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 don't have it, so it's not that hard to search for because you can put it. You can go from zero 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 dot zero dot zero dot zero to two five five dot two five five dot two five five dot two five five, which is about four billion codes. Well, four billion nowadays is not that hard to search for, and and when you're searching for it, so so somebody said, why don't I just run them, and if I get a hit, I'm just going to put it somewhere, and that's how Shodan became a thing. And now all they have to do is advertise, and they have a they have a money making strategy. Right. Yeah. You can you can sign up for accounts. You can pay for um, more advanced search techniques. So if you wanted to get down to the nitty gritty uh, and really get into detail about searching for something, you can. Um, it's really easy to use. Uh, so so it, try it out. It's it's fun. Uh, go to Shodan.io. Uh, click on Explore up at the top, and one of the best ones I found is Webcam. Click on Webcam, and there's a giant list of webcams. You can even, on the left-hand side, search by country. Uh, let's say Germany. Webcam's in Germany. Uh, and it wants you to log in then, so you don't have to do that. Um, but you can just scroll down this list and find something. Ah, here's something in Spain. And click, and a lot of the times, these are supposed to be public. Uh, a lot of the times, the people... Well, I wouldn't say a lot of the time. Sometimes these webcam operators specifically make their devices public. Like if it's a traffic camera, you know, watching a highway for traffic collisions. And uh, it's a public service. People can look at that. Newscasters can look at it and say, oh, wow, this highway is really jammed up today. You might want to avoid that on your commute home. Um, it, uh, a lot of it is, you know, watching weather or uh, public parks or other things. Sometimes it's not supposed to be public. Um, uh, there are people that set up, you know, home security systems uh, inside and outside, and they don't know that their webcams are open to the public. Or they think, oh, well, no one's going to watch it. No one can figure out what my IP address is, so I'm just going to put it out in the public, and I'll remember it. I'll keep it in a bookmark so I can always access it. And that's really the wrong way to go about it. Um, if people hook devices to the internet without realizing the security implications. Uh, they, they plug in things without realizing what it's going to do to their home router, if it's going to open up ports or not. And Shodan shows us a lot of the results of that. Now uh, we've got one central search engine to go look for any internet thing connected in IPv4 space. It's, uh, it's really powerful. Uh, it's definitely one of the first places you go to if you're a penetration tester, if you're a hacker, if you're uh, looking for research material, this is where you start. It's, I mean, th this can't be new. I mean, like you're saying, and I just lost people, but I just lost and came back. But it's, I mean, we've been talking about this for years. I guess they just decide, you know what? This can be a thing and we're going to do it. And and I just, I, I lost you because I, I put what I found when I was going to paste it in and I accidentally hit enter. But it was a multi-view of someone's house, like four different webcams. <laughs> nice. And, and look, I have absolutely no malice. Like it's, I almost want to go through it and email them and say, hey, uh, I know you're going to be embarrassed, but you should really do it. And here's a link to your house. And then the problem with that is by telling them, they may call the police and say, this guy did it. And you, ob you don't want to see, read about me being in jail for doing the right thing, but yeah. And this, that happens, unfortunately with, you know, with companies too. And I'll explain that here in a minute, but you're actually exactly right. Um, this kind of thing has always been happening. People have always been scanning the internet and, you know, uh, recently, I want to say in the past 10 years, uh, internet connections at homes and most businesses have gotten to the point where, you know, for not that much money, we can get a fast enough connection to scan the internet, to scan all of IPv4 space uh, in not, you know, a day or anything, but 
a reasonable amount of time, depending on your connection. And to collect information and storage has gotten cheap enough that we can now document everything we've seen on the net. Uh, and web technology has gotten advanced enough that we can put up a great web page to allow other people to search for it and make a business model out of it. Um, so it's it, it's not something that hasn't happened before. Uh, Shodan is really just one of the first places to put a really pretty, easy to use face on this type of power of searching the internet. And you're entirely right. You know, while it may be tempting to say, hey, um, listen, your webcam is exposed in your kid's room. I know it's like a baby monitor thing that you hook to the internet. I'm not creeping on your child. I'm just trying to let you know that this is insecure. You could get the cops called on you because someone thinks, you know, you've hacked them and you're watching their child. And it's just, it's a bad, terrible situation because people don't understand the technology. They don't understand the people, the white hat hackers trying to protect other people. Uh, and they don't understand how on earth all this fits together and, and why their, their kid would be accessible by the internet. And it, it scares people. Uh, being insecure, having something exposed or, or their privacy jostled a little bit terrifies people. And the police aren't, you know, they're, they're only human, right? Some people, some police officers understand technology completely, totally. Uh, a lot of them don't. It's not their day-to-day -day job to, you know, hammer on servers and, and secure stuff and make sure your public IP isn't leaking information everywhere. Uh, that's not their job. Uh, their job is to enforce the law. And if they think you're, you know, uh, some child predator creeping on that guy's kid, yeah, they're going to come to your house. Uh, so a lot of the time, it's better to leave well enough alone. It's Unfortunately, some companies do this too. When you say, hey, listen, uh, I was just scanning for something and you're leaking credit card details everywhere. I know some security researchers have been threatened by companies saying, oh, well, we're going to sue you then because you hacked us. And you know, the, the person goes, no, I didn't hack you. I just found out that you're really, really insecure. Uh, and you know, it, if they're not going to fix it, if they just keep threatening you, you just you walk away. Right. Hopefully you have a nice lawyer to back you up in case they follow through. Uh, but a lot of the time it's just empty threats. Well, again, the issue, if, if, if this is something where you do find the, our best course of action, our recommendation is go to the EFF. The EFF will do the talking for you. They will talk to you and and do and let the EFF handle it. Because that, that has been a topic in the past where we've talked about exactly how do you disclose something without getting arrested. And yeah, sending someone their photo of their baby sleeping saying, hey, just, just want to let you know that this is open. You will not, <laughs> the outcome will not be good for you. And, no, and there's no. something very hard to exactly to go through with that. Anyway, anyway, it, it's, it's, you know what happens? You get, you get a device, whatever that is whether it be a webcam, and they say, just for now, hook it up. And you say, you know what? I'll do the security later. I just want to get the router working. I can't update the firmware unless I'm on the internet and I need my router on the internet. And you say, oh, I'll do it later. And then what happens? You never do it later. And and at least Fios figured that out. If you have a Verizon Fios box, I think even Comcast, now they put the WPA key on the side of the box. And it's this crazy long hex code. The difference is, is that you know it's on the side of the box. So when you go to grandma's house and they say, oh, what's your code? Inevitably, the answer is I don't know, which drives me up a wall. How do a 30-something-year-old or a 25-year-old or my friends... I get the I get I get my grandparents, but you have someone that's young that just bought a house. They don't know their Wi-Fi password. At least you can say it's on the side of the box. Yes, it's a pain to type in, and you got to take a picture of it and everything else and type it in. But it's there because what happens? They realize is no one puts security on, and they forget to. And now you have a whole search engine dedicated to doing exactly this. Right. It's it's the defaults that really get people. And you know, if, if we want to secure people, if we're building websites or applications, the best way to make people secure is to bake the security in by default, right? These routers don't come with WEP anymore. It used to be that when, when you went to a big box store and you brought home a wireless router so you could finally get Wi-Fi, you didn't have to drag cords all over the living room like I had to. You were so excited. When you plugged it in, no password, completely open access, the, the you know access point name was Linksys, 
and there used to be you know stickers and, and laptop stickers that say uh, Linksys is my ISP uh, because you know everyone had a Linksys device. It was all open access. You could get Wi-Fi anywhere because no one secured them because that wasn't the default. If you pull it out of the box or if someone signs up for your site or they use your app and by default it's locked down enough to be secure most people aren't going to change those settings. Most people are just going to waltz along and have it be its thing. And that's one of the reasons why modern browsers today are so secure. They're secure out of the box. You have to actually work really hard to make something like Firefox or Chrome dangerous to the user. It's, I remember when AOL was the internet and people said you couldn't get them to get off AOL because that's how they got to the internet. Oh yes. Oh yes. And I, I remember. I do know of at least one person who still pays for AOL because AOL is the internet. Yep. And there's yes. nothing I can do. <laughs> it's I'm it's just... the default. It, it became the default and they can't change it because they're afraid they'll break something. Uh, and it's the same way with security. People don't want to mess with router settings. I mean, we've seen, you know, people who are listening to the show, I've seen router configuration pages. They're terrifying most of the time. They're absolutely mind-boggling terrifying because they've got these, these big technical words like, well, do you need 802.11x enterprise security? And then they're like, well, if it's good enough for businesses, so they click it and then like six fields drop down of you know public and private keys and certificates everywhere. And where's your radius server located and who stole your daughter? And it just, it gets worse and worse. And then they freak out and they go, ah, Maybe the security thing isn't for me. <laughs> they they go back to, to no security, or maybe, maybe just barely, they are brave enough to explore the other options like WPA2 personal, uh, or uh, uh, it's better than nothing, but not by much, WEP. Um, the defaults don't get changed. Uh, there's, there's a phrase that people like to use, which is the tyranny of the default, and that's absolutely true. Once you set it, it will never be changed by anyone. Did you, I always love the error message. Please contact your network administrator for, for help in this matter. Remember, yeah. you're, you're, you're configuring <laughs> your own router and you get an error message and you're like, please contact your network administrator. I'm the network administrator. What am I supposed to do? Please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what that usually meant to uh, to neighbors when I was a kid is contact your network administrator or or your your computer support personnel was go grab little Tommy he lives over there and he'll fix it for you if you give him five bucks. It was it was a very profitable childhood. It was it's it's funny but anyway we can go on and on and on about what we could find and I definitely like this keyword search NAS NAS route. <laughs> NAS storage devices, Drobos in USA. Fantastic. I should look at some of the Drobos on there. Or how about VPN? No, I guess you can get a VPN access, but SSH access. <laughs> Open SSH access. I, it's How do you do that? Because SSH is difficult to make insecure. I mean, you have to work to say, look, I don't really want a password on this account. I want to allow passwordless access to this account. Can you do that for me? And SSH is like, really, dude? You're on a Unix system. You had to go to a config file. And there's a comment that says, don't do this. But if you really want to, the option's here. And you had to enable that. And then restart the service daemon. I don't get how some of these things happen, unless it's like an embedded device that a developer opened up and then packaged it and sold it, and they went, oops, I forgot to secure that, which happens a lot, a shocking amount. It's, it's I, I don't understand. But anyway, look, it's, you get it happen once in college, your, your first day, you go find all the shared servers and all the shared printers, and you send a message to all the open printers, your printer is, in full color, your printer is on. And that gets said every <laughs> single time. Every single time. Yep. And they're like, and you, and you see them laugh and go hysterical. Anyway, we're more than halfway, and we spent way too much time on this. Uh, but let's let's move on. Spear phishing, or lost pass, as they call it. Last pass is not insecure. Take it, it's okay. It's a very, very good exploit that can happen to anything, not just last pass. And I only know of it for LastPass, but Tom read more about it, so I'm going to let him talk about it. 
So this this is a, is a uh, classic, classic fishing exploit, uh, and a beautiful, absolutely beautiful one. Uh, Sean Cassidy, he's a uh, he's a security researcher, uh, has put out this great post called Lost Pass. Uh, and if you want to get into uh, the nitty gritty technical details, uh, Steve Gibson also put out a Security Now episode titled Lost Pass. So check that out. Uh, if you're interested in the tech stuff. So what this is, um, in Chrome, uh, your extensions use this Chrome dash extension colon slash slash address to do all of their management. Uh, you, you know, in LastPass, you log in through that, you can set settings in there. Um, just about every Chrome extension uses that, like an internal web page, a, a web page only accessible to the extension and you in the browser. Uh, so this researcher said, well, how do I fish LastPass? How do I break through and collect all the passwords in it? Well, let's steal the master password. How do we do that? Uh, so he registered a domain um, called chrome-extension.pw slash colon slash, and then he put in this random string and uh, it looks, I mean, the the way the site looks and is designed is exactly the same site that the extension presents. There is no difference except for that URL. And unfortunately, the URL, um, uh, you have to really look close at it because it looks almost the same as what a general Chrome extension would use, except it's not. You're typing your master password into a website. Um, now, Chrome is going to make this uh, a little safer. LastPass has already deployed a fix where if they detect you're typing in your master password somewhere, they'll freak out and warn you and alarms will go off. Um, oh, I think I got that. Really, I think I got that the other yeah. day, and I'm like, when did this all of a sudden happen? Yeah, and that's that's because uh, Sean reported the bug. Well, he reported the vulnerability. I'm not going to call it a bug because it isn't really a bug in LastPass. Uh, it's a bug in humans, but it can be used to exploit LastPass. So. LastPass cares about their users, uh, and they absolutely do the right thing when it comes to code, programming, and making sure people are kept safe. So what they did is they said, okay, we're going to watch for them trying to type in their master password and freak out if they do, uh, which is great. That's fantastic. Um, let me let me see. There should be a, a timeline well, the here problem, of when... The, while you're looking for that, here is the other issue. The issue is LastPass just did... Uh, 4.0 update, which did change a lot of the UI elements. One being sometimes when it's doing a new website, it changes it to green. And if you didn't see it for the first time and you didn't know about LostPass, you're saying, what's going on? Why is this crazy? And you say, oh, it's green. It's new design, whatever it is. So you're okay. But that's a perfect opportunity for a bad guy, in, in this case, Sean, to say, you know what? I can make it blue. No one will know the difference because they'll just chalk it up to a new design layout. Like he really picked an awesome time to make this export. And it's it's just basically what it's just things that you're so used to with LastPass saying, yes, this is a new site or, oh, I have to type my master password in because I got logged down and taking you to a fake website. It's just it's second nature. I don't I don't even look anymore. So it is something that's that's very it's just, I would call it a social engineering hack that he figured this out and like you said, you don't need to get all the passwords, but if you get the master password, you're golden. Right. Right. All you have to steal is the one password, which it makes targeting attacks significantly easier because you're not if you want to hack a particular individual and not, you know, get credentials for a certain website, you don't have to wait for that individual to go to the website. Instead, you just have to trick them to give into giving you their master password. Now, keep in mind, this will only happen. This attack only works with um, web based password managers. If you're using something like KeePass, if it's it's like those fake pop-ups that or the the pop-ups that show like a windows ui and they say oh this super security thing is out of date click okay to continue and you're like clearly this is a web page pop-up 
I'm not going to click you, and then you click the X and it goes away. Um, it would be really weird if a website popped up and they said, oh, you should really give me your KeyPass credentials. Uh, and, you know, totally trust me, I, I promise it's safe. Uh, you're gonna be like, yeah, no, and click the X. So <clears throat> this attack really just works on web-based password managers. And again, if you want a web-based, you're giving up the, the security for some convenience that it's somewhere in the cloud and this type of exploit can happen. And again, right. and then you say, well, what about two-factor? Well, they, they spoof that too. And I wonder, would a YubiKey stop it? Uh, a YubiKey would not. Um, he did say that this attack is uh, was made much easier by actually having two-factor authentication. So how a lot of phishing happens, and phishing does get around two-factor authentication um, if you do it correctly. Um, if you're doing bad phishing, you're just asking for username and password, and you're not checking to see if an account has or does not have two-factor authentication. Um, so some of the more advanced scripts will take a username and password, pass it to the website real quick, watch and see if they get a login event or if they get another two-factor authentication box popping up that says, hey, what's your code? And then their script will see that and kick off a, hey, what's your code on the phishing website and try to grab the code from the user that way. Uh, other things like phone factor, which send a text message uh, or there's an app and you can hit yes or no on the links to confirm or deny access to whatever. It's it's yes or no, but for two-factor. Uh, in most cases, a user will just hit yes because they're afraid of breaking something. Uh, if you know the phone pops up and says, hey, such and such IP wants to access such and such service. Do you want to allow this? Unless you're security conscious, most people hit yes. Um, a YubiKey could work the same way, where you say, hey, what's your username and password? Oh, wait, what's your two-factor authentication? Go ahead and paste it in here. Uh, and you can watch for either a YubiKey prompt or a Google Authenticator prompt, because they are different. Um, now, a U2F, like a universal two-factor, I don't think that would be, because it's using FIDO and because it's hashing the domain name, I don't think U2F would work for this attack. It also needs um, a server. But, it, need, it would have to also spoof, I think, the server, right? So the U2F right. connects to some server, and it goes from there. Yeah, it, it, it'll hash the domain name and send it off. So I, I don't think it would work there. Uh, but the reason that two-factor authentication makes this attack easier is LastPass, if you're just using username and password, uh, requires email confirmation if you're logging in with a new IP address. Well, because the IP address you're logging into is from the attacker or a server that the attacker controls, that's what's doing the login thing for your for LastPass, um, it, it would automatically send that, because you wouldn't be logging in from his computer or his server, it would automatically send you an email saying, hey, do you want to allow this IP to get access to your account? We've never seen this guy before. Are you okay with that? Um, but if you had two-factor authentication, they assume you know what you're doing, and they assume you haven't been phished or hacked, and they don't send you a confirmation email. They just let you right through. Now, LastPass has changed that to where even if you are using two-factor, um, they require email confirmation for all logins from new IPs. Uh, and Sean mentions that this substantially mitigates lost pass, but it does not eliminate it. Um, it's so yeah, it's look, it's it's good it's that LastPass Sean contacted LastPass. LastPass absolutely jumped on it, figured out a way to fix it, and definitely, I mean, we're talking about it. There's some sort of disclosure saying, "Hey, look, this isn't this isn't <clears throat> we didn't screw up here. This is." This is just, it's very, very good trickery that can happen on, this can happen on one password, this can happen on Dashlane, all of those are online based. And I think the only one that's not necessarily susceptible to this is uh, KeePass because it's offline. But then again, you have to install Correct. even the portable edition, sticking your USB key inside a public computer, which you definitely may not want to do. Right. Load up your phone, and then you got to type the. You got to find a way to get the password into your phone. Whereas LastPass, you're giving up that little bit of. You're giving. 
you're going to get more stories like this if you want to be in the cloud or anything like that. And it's not saying that LastPass was compromised. It's just saying that, hey, look, we found an exploit that you may have not thought of. So, Right. And the, I think the bigger issue here is that um, management pages coming from Chrome extensions don't look or feel any different than a standard web page. So we're going to include this link in the show notes. Take a look at the actual uh, Chrome extension because Sean in his blog post points this out uh, where he, he shows the real last pass and then he shows um, the domain name he registered to look like it. And it's really, really close. Unless you've got a trained eye, unless you're absolutely looking for it, you can't tell a difference. Uh, except in the, the small changes to the URL. But I think this is an issue for the Chrome team to solve, for Google to get on it. They need to make these uh, the extension management pages look and feel different. Maybe change the URL bar to a different color, right? Make it make it orange or something. I, I don't know. They're, they've got designers to figure out problems like this. But it needs to be different than anything the user would see on the web. You would need because to extend if it's it not the, the the Chrome extension. Well, not if not if you changed it to a different color. Not if it was you know bright purple or something weird like that. Maybe not a green bar because we all know the green bar means EV cert. But you know, make it something internal to Chrome extensions or extensions in general. And remember, Firefox is moving towards the Chrome extension model, so they're going to have this problem too. This is really something to be solved by all the major browser vendors. So phishing is harder to do. No. Anyway, we got to end. We are running long, which we never thought we would do, but we are running long. And if I can remember to put this in the show notes, I'm putting it in the blab. It is some guy, some, I'm assuming it's a guy, I don't really know, took a picture, and Tom found this, of his RSA key, or put a webcam on his RSA key with his username and pass, or his password. I don't know, I guess. He did obscure one of those details. We don't have three things. We only have two. Right. We, we have a pin for the RSA key. We do not have the site it goes to or the username. But it's... It, the, and we have the RSA key. We have the, a, a video of the RSA key itself. You can refresh and get a brand new token number. Maybe. Remember the story about five years ago where the guy mailed his RSA key to the Chinese uh, subcontractor? Maybe yeah, that's what it is. Maybe he just left it open. I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> but this is where here's. If you give somebody a convenience way out, this is why. This is why you have to change your password every thirty days. Because of things like this. Anyway, we are done. I'll put this hopefully in the show notes if I can remember. If not, uh, harass me on Twitter and I will get it to you. Anyway, have a good night, everyone, and we will see you next week. See you, everyone. Bye.